before before Normandy was invaded in uh, June 1944, yeah. did you have any idea that you would be sent sent to they would be landing in Normandy? No, well, no one did, didn't they? Well, you must know that the uh, Hitler thought we'd go from Dover to Calais, didn't he? And he built all the um, we didn't build them. We had these blow up tanks. And they looked like tanks you could, uh, they were, what do you call them? Dummy tanks. Huh? Yeah, he had them and um, he massed them there. And it, but Hitler wouldn't, um, uh, he thought we'd go to short this route, 21 mile, wasn't it? But um, we didn't, we went the longest one, well, it was in Portsmouth, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. To Falaise, Falaise, was it? Mm -hmm. Well, it was Normandy, anyhow. And of course, uh, what was it? They tried to wake him up when the invasion started, but um, he gave orders, you know, that not to be awakened because they lost a lot of time by that. And they had to move all their tanks and that towards where we were, yeah. Did you think we might invade Calais at some point? Everyone thought we'd go, yeah, the shortest route, Dover to Calais. Mm. Yeah, that was the big, the big um, surprise that we did that. Remember, we had to talk to our colonel once before we went, and he. He was always very complimentary to the German soldiers, I suppose, with truth. And he's, he's say quite a lot, German soldier is a good soldier, which he was. One of our, our gunners, whose brother was a POW, he stood up and said, so are we, sir. And there's nothing he could say, was it? Uh, oh yes, yes, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, Bombardier Paddock, his name was, and I remember him to this day. And I thought, good on you, man. You, you, you stood. I mean, we all knew a German soldier a good soldier. They always have been. And uh, even the poor Russians found that out, didn't they? Uh, not that they didn't reply in kind. But of course, some of those where the Yanks landed, they um, they had to scale the cliffs and lost a lot of men through that. Hell of a thing. Do you remember the one, do you, do you recollect the one where they had a full scale, um, something Sands in Devonshire, and it was like a practice. Mm -hmm. You remember? I don't know its name. I we can't lost that. Slapton Sands. Slapton Sands, yeah? I don't know. I can look it up later if you want. You look that up. Mm -hmm. you, you've not heard of that one. I do know there was uh, some place where they trained, but I yeah, yeah, forgot its name. But, um, I don't know exactly what, but, but Jerry's found out and they had submarines there and they did a hell of a lot of, hell of, a lot of damage. Slapped and sands. You can remember that. Well worth seeing. Of course, that was hush hush. They moved the whole village out. Everyone went. I, um, you know, the, they just marched them out. Well, not marched them out, but they all had to go. And then they practiced the invasion. Mm. Slapped and sands. Don't forget it. Okay. It's, good. it's a good thing to watch. It's um, not talked about now, of course, a lot. Did you hear about it when it happened? No, good God, no, no, no. Oh, no, it was the big, biggest secret of the war. That was kept, you know, that was kept very, very bad for morale, that would have been. Mm. Mm -hmm. Slept in sands. We didn't learn we were being sent to Normandy at all. We were in uh, Salisbury Plain and we were. We were down, we were a complete fighting battery. We were ready to go. And we went on dummy runs, down to the docks, and it all came to nothing. 
and we all came back on the Salisbury Plain. And um, well, one day when we went out on, on the, in the morning uh, on one of these morning calls, every, everything went. Well, not everything, what we called the fighting battery went first. And the odds and sods came, came later on, hopefully. And uh, we went off in the morning. And as we went off, about five in the morning, there was the colonel of the regiment standing at the full salute for us. And we thought, yes, we're not coming back today. Yeah. And we were right. The landing craft were there. And we went on board. And, uh, I guess one o'clock in the morning, we put our flap down on the beaches. And it wasn't very healthy, but as usual, uh, our word for them was the PBI, the poor bloody infantry, had gone and sorted it out before we got there because we couldn't storm the beaches with six-inch six guns that weighed a ton each. We, we had to have a secure beach and, uh, you know, vehicles had to pull them. We had scammers pulling them, yeah. And um, well, we got quite a way inland. And, of course, the airborne had dropped as well. So, um, oh, oh, it's a long time ago, isn't it? But, uh, I'll be truthful, I still feel proud that I was there. I wouldn't have offered to go, but uh, coming out in one piece, you know, and uh, and it showed me Europe. I'd never been abroad before, like a lot of the boys, yeah. So, uh, w when were you actually sent into Normandy? I went there on the fourth day. Uh, so would that be the tenth? Yeah, I think it was the fourth day. Mm -hmm. mm. And uh, did you come across on a troop ship? I forget now what we come across on. No, it's a landing craft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the front drops down here. Yeah. What went on one of them, a big one? Hmm. Of course, you had the Mulberry Harbour then. You could land like, um, you didn't get your feet wet. You could land on that and walk across. Yeah, Mulberry Harbour, that's right, yeah. And was that where you landed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and were, you, were you impressed by the, what they'd done by bringing the port across the channel? Oh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Marvellous how they towed that across, didn't they? And they got the uh, Pluto, didn't they? The pipeline under the ocean. Marvellous things. Marvellous things they got up, didn't they? Which um, weren't um, spoken about till after the war was done. It's pretty marvellous. Pipeline under the ocean, yeah. On D-Day, one o'clock in the morning, which I strictly was D plus one, and by one hour, I suppose, um, Landing on the beach in Normandy, a um, certain amount of high explosive flying about. And then um, there was a chap who lived near here, and he was a bootmaker or shoe repairer. His name was Dickie Mead, and he was always known as a Mona. And he was just a gun number. Anyway, he, when we landed on the beach, his, his vehicle got stuck, and it was all out on push. And there's a dicky meat at one o'clock in the morning on an enemy beach with unpleasant things going on, moaning away, I shouldn't be doing this, I should be mending boots. <laughs> if there's anything more ridiculous. <laughs> but it's one of those things that... Kept people sticky, going, yeah. yeah. And also, when we went inland, one of the, in the next morning when it got, uh, got light, we, we got be inland then and we had vehicles and we were in and um one of the chaps from I think he was from the country somewhere and uh, he said oh this is France much like England I suppose and Bob Morris who was who was a Liverpudlian they had the Liverpudlian humour Expect the bleeding grass to be pink, do you? 
and, and those things you remember the rest of your life. It, it's dark, but you do, you know. And uh, it's those things that made it tenable, I suppose. It, it was your friends, your comrades. You didn't do for the bloody king. You did it for your comrades. You didn't let them down. And that's a, that about says it, I suppose. What was happening on the beach when you landed at the Mulberry Harbour? Just clearing up. Just clearing up all the time, yeah. Mm. So were they just... Wasn't much, wasn't much live stuff coming down. No. So were there, was, were there ships, other ships being unloaded at the time? Can't really remember that. Mm. Can't really, I, I would imagine so. Mm. I would imagine so, yeah. Did you see any casualties returning from the front line? No. No. Mm -hmm. We just had to sit and wait mm -hmm. to get orders from, you know, where to go sort of thing. Keep in the, keep in the, in the lorries, yeah. We went into action pretty soon and I always remember House at Sea behind us was the old World War One battleship, the War Spy. And she had 15-inch guns. And she was pumping them out over her head inland on the German line. And you could hear them whistling over there. And I thank God they're not coming down here. We had huge guns. And we had them big enough, 155 millimetre with 6-inch, give, give or take. Oh, I never found out how the Americans came to make 155 mil guns because they... They never went for metric, did they? They still don't, do they? It's all inches and that, but, uh, but we, we always made inch guns, six inch, but strange enough, the Yanks did metric. I don't know why. But um, of course there was always a, I suppose, a rivalry, if you like, between our forces and the Americans because they... We were landed side by side virtually, and um, I know some of the Americans thought we had it easy, and vice versa to us, uh, as you do. The regiment had landed before, you see. They'd, um, they'd landed on D-Day, the, the regiment, so we just had to go and find them mm -hmm. to um, reinforce them. And where had they gone? Oh, I don't know where. I was looking at book. <laughs> Would it be Con? No, no, no. No, they've been here. I could tell you through the book. Mm -hmm. Maybe, uh... Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't Con, no. But uh, we just found them and, um... And joined them. Reinforcements that come by. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Have they suffered heavy losses? No, very lucky. No, very lucky. And were you ever yeah. attacked by German planes? Yeah, they come over quite a few times. Yeah. But we were in the dugout, you know, the command place was covered. Was in a dugout with like a canvas top, you know, a camouflage top, and um, we weren't attacked by um, by planes, but so we're just photographing, you know. We were brought into a led into a field, and um, we 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 had four guns, and we each. Uh, gun crew had a captain and about four men. But you had to have quite a bit of strength there because the shells weighed near enough a hundred weight. And, um, and the, usually the gun captain was a full sergeant. And uh, they all went by numbers, number one, two, three. And you could have some of the guns firing and not the others because it all came over loudspeakers which we signalers used to put in. Every gun had its own little loudspeaker and the wires would run to the command post and uh, you'd, you'd get, give the instructions uh, all guns or number one only, number two or whatever 
and then you give them the t- uh, a map reference and east things before north things and that's where they wanted the shells to follow and in the command post we'd have to work out uh, the amounts of charge to put in the guns and what elevation to put and it was all well the mathematics if you like and uh, then on the loudspeakers we'd um, speak to the guns and tell them what to put on their um, dials there and uh, and what um, what particular charge because one of one of the lads he was good at putting words to songs and uh, he put some one of the, these fire orders was HE charge normal fuse super quick or high explosive is the sort of shell you're going to put in. Charge is the cordite that blows them out and you could have certain, you could have uh, low lots or hard lots depending how far you wanted it to, to be blown. And, uh, and the fuse on the shell knows with what sort of delay it was before it exploded. So you screwed that in, but the gun crews did all that. So you just, uh, and uh, he was good at typical Liverpool. He took La Donna Mobile, uh, HE charge normal, fuse super quick, and when well, rest, rest. Then you may rest. And he was a genius. He kept us all smiling. And even the officers used to say, what's Brown's latest? <laughs> it's the spirit that kept us going, really. But we had two or three tricks, you know. When you, uh, if you left a vehicle at night, well, any time, you left that in first gear. No brake, didn't put the brakes on, left it in first gear. So when you got in there, you just put your foot, you didn't mess about with the gear handle. You put your foot on the clutch and you started it and you'd go. Whereas that two or three seconds you find in first gear. And then the other thing was, uh, you had the uh, differential, you know, at the, at the back wheel, you got the big differential. and. Um, I was painted white. It was about that big. What were the other things in there? Differential and the, I can't remember the names of the other thing. And then each each one of the... Uh, I don't think they do it in the little cars, things we had, like the little Jeep things. They weren't Jeeps, they were, they were British. But you'd have it on the high vehicles and you had, a, you had like a, a torch about that big. And that was run off the the vehicle battery that used, and that shone on that white differential. What's it called? Is it called the big? I think so. Anyhow, the big axle at the back. Big. It is a differential. One goes one way. One goes because you've got um. Anyhow, I'm going back. But you've got to. Um, uh, and I wasn't going to say was the light shine on shone on that, so you had no vehicle lights at all. So the one behind kept his eyes on that light. And did did you know that? And the one and you had it fixed on yours just the same. So you had no side lights or headlights, well you wouldn't have. And you you kept your eyes on that. You were in like a convoy. And, um, yeah, a couple of little things that, um, yeah. Because if, you, if you've got bombs or anything going near you, mm-hmm. you, you're getting hold of the gear. You might put it in the wrong gear, but if you left it in the first gear, put your foot straight on the clutch and start it, you'd move. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that. I certainly didn't. <laughs> What's it called? The differential and the uh, annoys me. Oh, a half shaft. That's right, half shaft. Mmm. Marvellous. 
the um, what's that saying? That the uh, necessity is the mother of invention. So you can drive like that. No one can. No one can see that light. No one at all can see that light. Yeah, but I think it's marvelous little thing like that. The efficiency of our organisation, I couldn't believe, really. Because, you know, before we went over, we were shown photographs of the very field that we were going to uh, dig our guns in from, in Normandy. It had been so cleverly done, and apart from the actual beach, and it, it worked out like that. And we... Villers, I think, it was about one in the morning anyway, we <coughs> went into our field and dug the guns in where you had to dig them. They had, the guns had two metal trails like, uh, you probably like, uh, uh, at the back, you know, and um, they had, at the, at the, uh, the end of them, they had like spades. And you dug at certain spaces, you dug a, a slip in the ground which those spades would go on. So when the gun, um, when you fired it, the whole carriage came back, but except the wheels didn't move because it was on, on oil, oil um, buffers. But to, to, so that the actual gun didn't move, these spades are about that big, and of course, when the gun presser went back, these two big spades took, and they had a recoil system on which was oil, all figured, so it took the took the wolf out of it and put it back again. But of course, when you were firing, I mean, our shells were six hundred pounds, and the the explosive you put in was. Well, a high explosive, called I, yeah, rolls about that big. Uh, but it had to be to blow a hundred pound shell miles virtually. And uh, no one ever stood behind the breach because in the centre of the breach was a little hole. And if ever there was a misfire, the power that should have blown the shells out and sent a column of, of well, well, I won't say hot air, but uh, it was well, it, hot wasn't a word for it. It was like a ball of fire, only about that one, and it would bore a hole straight through you. So nobody stood behind. <laughs> you stood on either side of the barrel because it they came. But these were uh, about the same size as um, the Royal Naval guns, six inch. Now they're quite big for field guns, because the the one that the, was the darling of most artillery was the twenty five pounder, as you no doubt know. If the um, anything done come down from the observation post that the uh, Germans were going forward, well, the coordinates would be sent, wouldn't they? They get and then we'd fire just. Just to catch them, I suppose, yeah. You didn't really understand a lot of it. You just hear the, you know, fire. Yeah. The one, the one word you mustn't say on, on the radio is uh, repeat. So I didn't get your message in speech. I couldn't say repeat because that might be picked up as someone had got the coordinates uh, for a certain district and that repeat meant repeat the fire. Mm -hmm. That was the one thing you didn't, you, if I didn't hear what you were saying, I would say, say again. Yeah, that was the one. That, you, did you know that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the one word you don't say. Because if, if the if the radio reception was bad, if you follow, you you might get a bit of that bit of a message, and um, it 
it, the last word would be repeat. But if I said it like not connected with that at all, and just to say uh, repeat because I haven't got your message, you take it that my the last message where you get coordinates, I'm telling you to repeat the fire the guns again. Yeah. The army had the aircraft, and they were air OPs, and they were a light biplane which were flown by trained Royal Artillery officers, and they used to spot for it. And sometimes they give us their targets by radio. They spot, at one time they spotted Germans lining up for pay parade. And of course there was a load of them there all in one spot. And he radioed their map reference back to us. And we knew by how we worked our calculations that theoretically our shields should have dropped there or pretty well you couldn't guarantee landing them on a sixpence but uh, and that's what happened and they could our aircraft said so little single let le- um seat of osters they were and they bobbed up and down over the horizon and just pop up for a look and then well they had to be careful because the germans knew about them and they put a spandau on them or something like that but yeah, they had uh, they had wooden bullets. They must have been for snipers, because when they went into you, you you bloody great hole, and that was all full of wood splinters. Wicked, wicked bloody things. Yeah. Mm. And did your command post have anti-aircraft defences? No, we only had our own stuff. Didn't have any, um, no, didn't have anything like that. No. Would the command post ever just be a tent or was it always a dugout? Most times it's a dugout, yeah. Yeah, most times. Mm. Mm. With like a camouflage top on it. Well, I don't even remember, you know. Of course, he was in there nights as well as days, you know. It was, um, that was 24. I think he did eight hour shifts. He had night as well as day. But not necessarily going to fire at night, but you might have to move at night. Mm-hmm. And did German artillery ever land near you? No, no. Mortars, we, oh, we had mortars. There was, um... Mini woofers they used to scream when they went over like like a yeah grenades. They were like a grenade mini. Mm. There you go. <laughs> what was the most frightening weapon the Germans used? I think those. Uh, well, I was saying the mortars. Because some of them, they'd be on a railway, they'd be on a railway um, empty, you know, flatbed. And they'd just have a line of mortars on there and they'd fire them all at once. And they made a screaming, screaming noise. Like... Yeah. And then the train would move. you will never find it. And... Most things German military, it was good. Their tanks were far superior to ours, especially Americans the American tanks, because they they hadn't got enough thickness of armour on them. And the, the Tiger, the German tank, had um, 75 millimeter cannons on with, with armour-piercing shells. They, they'd go straight through that. Well, it was a massacre where well, perhaps there'd be five in a, a tank through. And that thing will go round and round when you looked inside it. There was no nothing hardly human left. And until you we were upset, I don't go anymore, but there were only mangled remains in there. But the hole in the armour was about that big. And it used the it had hollow charge as they called it. Well that pierced armour plating, although it was only air. 
but it was with such force. And, and it went in there and went round and round the interior of the tank, killing any human being. Well, putting them out of action anyway, and there's usually four or five men in there. And uh, I've seen the British ones as well, the Cromwell, with the, with the, the lid up, and there were no bodies in there, but uh, you see the, the Germans had a, a very good anti-tank gun at a hollow charge, a blast a hole that big and explode inside, and nothing could live. And the turret was left open, and I looked inside, and the, the walls and everything had a coating of blood, and you can imagine that shell going round and round, killing everybody in there, you know. Do you remember the first time you were... Uh you contributed to a battle that was going on? Not really. It might all come out afterwards. You didn't know beforehand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it all come out afterwards. Yeah. And what, what did the French towns in Normandy look like? Well, they weren't too bad. We weren't knocked about a terrible lot. The, um, you know, the villages. There weren't many, we didn't go into big towns there. We didn't go to any big towns. They were more or less villages. And, um, I, I forget the name. Bocage was one. Villiers, some of the other. Villiers Bocage. Villiers, yeah, there was another two or three others on Villiers Bocage, and, uh, um, but they weren't damaged too much, those, because they could just come through them. There was no point in it. There was nothing to be wasting your ammunition. And then we got on the move again, didn't we, from there? Yeah. And it was the other one, um, I can remember. Hmm. Are there any particular incidents from your time in Normandy that stand out to you? Hmm. Not really, no. The, um, the cattle and that were terrible because they hadn't been milked. All the um, farmers had gone. To get out the way, and the and the cows were just busted. They used to bust open, and the smell out this world that was it used to yeah. It just used to burst. Um, cows, well anything, yeah. That was one that that was one of the worst things. The um. A field, you know, full of them. But, um, of course, that was very hot weather as well, when it? it? was June. June, yeah, and July. Mm. Yeah, I can remember the smell of that was, oh, tiny calm disguise. <laughs> oh, yes, we went through towns and villages, that, especially in France. That, well, let's face it, we demolished them. And some, some of them were worse than others. And where the people went to live, I don't know. And I always remember going past one village and there was a lot of thatched roofs in Normandy, much like Devon. And um, this particular house, the thatch was burning and the Germans deliberately lit it and ignited it. They were retreating. And there was a poor lady who lived there, and she was wringing her hands. Pauvre, pauvre Normandy. And I always felt, you know, I know we've been bombed and that in England, but we haven't seen the, the whole of the neighbourhood sort of smashed and nowhere to go. And no, of course, we were remembered more in when we got to. Eastern France, because the locals came out and asked if we got any bully beef. 
and from the World War One, they remembered that. And of course, uh, our assaults were there in in the beginning of this war, well, this last one, weren't they? Before Mr. Hitler threw them out. Did you ever see the da- specific damage that the twenty five pounders have caused? Oh yeah, yes, yeah. Because when you advanced, sometimes you got to where you were far, where you had been firing at, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're quite quite naughty. Twenty five pounders, yeah. Can you describe what you saw when you were there? Well, not all the people they hit. I mean, were there a lot of craters in the ground? They didn't make much of a crater. Um, if they hit a building, it'd go well, but a crater would. Um, hmm. Don't remember that a lot. A lot of that, anyhow. Yeah. Don't remember a lot of that. Do, no. do you remember seeing any? German tanks that had been hit by twenty five pounders. They wouldn't do. They wouldn't touch a tank. Twenty five pounder wouldn't touch it. No way. Mm. No. Saw sort of burnt out tanks that you know was the side of the road and that, but a twenty five wouldn't touch that. Um. So you want you want armor piercing. Uh, shell. To, to touch anything like a tank, whereas I think the 25 pounder was more or less um, for shrapnel, you know, bits. I think there were different types of them, different because you had a, you had a fuse on it, you could set the fuse. Hmm. Because it's a long, long time ago. I can remember seeing the um, uh, the uh, the tanks. Mm. Were you were uh, firing towards Khan when you were in Normandy? Khan, yes. Yes, the um, yes. Well, the, that's why the city was mostly destroyed, because the Germans would not abandon it or declare it uh, a non-war area, which you could do if they were honest enough. They could abandon Khan and say, um, "We've nothing there now," you know. But I felt guilty in a way because I was in the artillery that the ordinary people were getting, the French people were getting the stick from it, really. I mean, the Germans were there because they, well, they started it. They they were there, but the poor civilians who saw, I mean, to go by and see some of the, the villages, are, I've got a book at somewhere at home called Five Agra, Fifth Army Group Royal Artillery. And there's a, a there was a man who helped make this book and he could draw. And and uh, was, I remember vividly one it's only about that big a page and it said uh, Villas Bacage, that was one of the villages, Villas Bacage had been liberated and the liberated was in inverted commas, and it was just ruined that we destroyed the town and that or village. That that wasn't you. You had no choice. Uh, and one of the first things you did was try and knock church tower tower down because church tower being high, you had observers watching up there. The the the, the opposition would have spotters up there. So you try to knock a church tear. It's all about all's fair in love and war. <laughs> we used to go around the farms and that there, and um, they had cider. And they made um, a brandy from the cider. What was it called? Calvados. The brandy was called Calvados. You can buy it now. And um, a great big oval barrels in some of the farmhouses there. There was no one there. I mean, we weren't looting or anything like that. And um, there was eggs there, and um, and up the um, uh, the fire, you they put, lots of times where we went, there'd be um, uh, a bit of pig, pig's leg. And that turned into ham, smoked. 
and that uh, that was beautiful. So we we weren't looting or anything like that. I mean, the food was only had gone rotten if it didn't. But the um, the cows were the cows were the worst. The Germans had retreated, obviously, and they'd left their death dead behind on the roadside. And I remember a, a French woman, and she came out from a normal village nearby, I think, and she had high-heeled shoes on, and this German, dead German, was lying on, on the grass at the side of the road. And she deliberately went over and ground the heel into his dead face and the sheer hatred. And I thought, who am I to... How do you know what she's been through or her village has been through or what her father's been through? And uh, it's a case of re what she was so... But, I mean, he never felt anything anyway, but it was nothing that made me feel sick. But we always... Oh, I will say that um, some of our blokes were quite good at searching dead Germans in case there was anything of value or a risk. But that was it. It was, it, you know, you live for yourself. And there weren't many perks, if you can call it that. Not that I could ever steal myself to do it. And, of course, the Germans weren't above booby-trapping some of their dead. That you start on that. And, You'd be gone as well. 